Okay. Um, so, so, so I'm going to try to stick this stuff together and want to acknowledge, um, you know, colleagues and co-authors on a variety of the work that I'm going to talk about, um, talk about here. And let's see if I can get this thing to work. Ah, it does. So um, a little bit of a road map on, on what I'm hoping to cover, and I tend to deviate quite a bit, so, um, so hopefully we'll get to all of this stuff. Uh, a little bit of motivation, and I think we've already had that, but I'll probably touch on that again. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, an assessment that, uh, that we've done that has tried to think about uh, livestock diseases that are present in the United States, um, and how many of those have a potential wildlife component involved in the the transmission or the life cycle of the pathogen. Um, identify some social challenges. I'll briefly touch on social political, but uh, and that might be outside of sort of the realm of what this group might end up doing. But I think it's something that complicates these systems. I think it's a challenge. I think it dictates the data that's available. I, th I, th I think it's worth thinking about uh, to some degree. Um, and then talk about some challenges and maybe get to an example. So. Um, so we've talked about livestock, and what we haven't really talked about much is actually this domestic landscape. And, and Graham and I and some others chatted a little bit about this with Hendra and how you know, landscapes have changed and do change, and that can influence uh, emergence of, of pathogens. Um, and so I think that's an interesting one to think about. Um, and so uh, Damien covered uh, wildlife. Um, we didn't talk much about peri-domestics. Um, some people would put them here. Some people would put them here. But I think that they're, they're an interesting one, especially that they can you know, sort of be a bridge, bridge species. So, but I'm going to try to talk about the red pieces um, and try not to cover stuff that's already been talked about. Some of you might be familiar with this paper. It's one that I like to, to talk about when, when talking about the wildlife livestock interface. I really like this paper. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out some of the, con the conclusions that the authors had. You know, they concluded that the rate of future zoonotic disease emergence will be closely linked to the evolution of the agricultural environment nexus. And to me, that means the wildlife livestock interface. Um, they go on to point out that, um, that we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, the available research inadequately addresses the complexity interrelatedness, which significantly limits our ability to break prevent and respond to zoonotic disease emergence. And uh, if you haven't read this paper, I'd, I'd encourage you to. I, I, I would have to agree with the authors on a lot of their points. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a new and a young field in, in a lot of ways. We've talked about some of the economic issues. Um, I don't believe we've got an economist here, do we? No? Um, but this is what drives a lot of a lot of the work that's that's done in this area. I mean, we're talking in some cases we're talking, you know, pretty real dollars. One one point two billion, three hundred million. Um, you know, there are some better numbers that were pre pre presented earlier for for TB. Um, you know, seventy one billion for avian influenza, one point five billion for feral swine. Um, so I mean, th these are really the economic aspects of these problems are really what drives our involvement um, in them, and oftentimes. Um, yeah, most of this is going to be sort of North America, U.S. centric. Yeah, um, yeah. This 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 right here, I think, um, was uh, impact to the poultry industry if there was a pandemic, H5N1 uh, outbreak. Um, bovine Babesia. This is reestablishment to its historic range in the United States if white-tailed deer were involved in the transmission cycle. So. But the point is, I mean, these are, these are real numbers. And I mean, the list, the list would go on. But you could also prioritize the diseases that we put an emphasis on based on this, right? Um, and so I think that that's, that's something for the, that this group might think about a little bit. We talked a little bit about white nose syndrome and um, you know, dollars allocated towards that. But they're small potatoes compared to some of the dollars that have been allocated to FMD and, and, and other things. Um, we've touched a little bit on TB, and I'm going to try to sort of bring these um, back to the wildlife livestock interface a little bit. Um, so this is an example of uh, TB that's present in, in cattle. This is where we've identified uh, culture-positive uh, cattle, individual animals in the United States or in North America. Um, 
this is where we've been able to trace it back to the herds of origin of those, those animals. And so you'll see there's a, there's a pretty big discrepancy, and it's because we, we are not very good at doing those trace back investigations, and it has to do with limitations for animal ID and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, we have, you know, imported animals. We've got um, circulation of TB within uh, North America in livestock. But then we also have um, the potential for spillover into wildlife. And so I think. I th Can you go back one slide? Sure, yeah. So you were saying that you thought this was related to your, your sampling and your, your trace back ability, right? Rather than say there are source areas and then there are areas that acquire it from a source. I, I, yeah, so that's a, that's a good point, Paul. I think, I think there's a couple things going on here. I think that. There are likely source areas, uh, and there are regions that, that, um, that we don't often find TB, the southeast being one of those. And so um, there might be some movement aspects, but it's also an issue of um, an inability for us to connect the dots in terms of, you know, we identify an animal at slaughter, because most of our surveillance is slaughter surveillance, um, and then the inability to actually trace that back to a, a herd of origin. And so that, that means that there's a, an infected herd out there that's producing animals, they're moving through the marketing chain and we're identifying them after they've been in the system for a few years or sometimes longer. So, so I think that there are source sync things that are happening here in addition to just gaps in, in data. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so I think, I think the point with TB is just a nice one to talk about, but um, it, it, because it's a livestock disease and it spills over to wildlife, and, and that, that'll be something I touch on quite a bit as I talk, is that oftentimes we think about sort of thinking about wildlife transmitting a pathogen to livestock, and I think that we need to be thinking about the bidirectional nature of transmission. And so this is an example. This is um, in North America. We've, we've identified at least 11 populations uh, where Imbovis has been in wildlife. There's four, maybe five, that are now endemic. Um, and in, in many of these cases, it's, you know, there's a, a livestock component, certainly in Michigan and Minnesota, where we think that we've eradicated it. Um, Riding Mountain National Park, you know, these are because there was spillover originally from, from livestock. Um, Feral Swine in California, um, and, and here as well, both cattle related. Uh, no idea about this, and this hasn't been confirmed yet. And this is domestic animals as well. So it's, you know, sort of highlights the, the issues of spillover from domestics to wildlife. So I'm going to briefly talk about um, an assessment we did for the United States where we looked at the uh, 86 reportable diseases, livestock diseases, to OIE. Um, we critically evaluated these and, and asked the question, you know, um, can any of these uh, can wildlife be involved in the transmission, maintenance, or life cycle of the pathogen? So we set the bar very low. Um, and then I'll, I'll kind of sp hopefully spend most of the time on number three. So one, one of the initial things that we found was that, um, you know, the, the increase, the rapid increase in publications that have occurred, and this is out of Scopus, but I mean, if you look at PubMed and many of the others, um, that you get the same thing. And so it's like a vast majority of the publications have occurred in the last 15 to 20 years. Um, and so while many of us have spent our entire careers in this field, Certainly, there's, um, we're young. It's a young science, right? There's a lot to learn, and TB is a great example of that. I mean, who would have guessed that it would have become, in the 70s, nobody would have thought that it would have become endemic in white-tailed deer. Um, historically, we thought that TB wouldn't, wouldn't become endemic in, in free-ranging swine based on some of what we learned in Australia historically. So I think the, the point is that there's a lot to, to be learned from these systems, and, and I think that we, there's a lot, of, a lot of things to be optimistic about there. So from evaluating the literature for those 86 diseases, 79% uh, of those in the United States have a potential uh, wildlife component. 40% are zoonotic, so it's not really that different from that, the seminal work by Jones. Um, what I like to highlight here is that, you know, if you think about our big uh, livestock commodities, cattle, poultry, um, Swine, you know, the, for the reportable diseases, the, the large percentage of them are, have a wildlife or a potential wildlife component. Um, so that's sort of the motivation for, for sort of thinking about transmission at, this, at the interface. 
And so furthermore, if we think about there's the 20 pathogens that we currently in the United States anyways have a national uh, program, whether it's control or management or some sort of program where we dedicate resources to, um, 70 percent of those have a wildlife component. Um, and so I think this also illustrates that once you have spillover of a livestock pathogen into wildlife, control, management, it just becomes exceedingly problematic. And um, we spend a lot of our time thinking about, you know, what do we do once it's there? You know, what does that transmission process look like? Can we develop mitigations or vaccines or that kind of thing? But, you know, it, it would, I think one of the more important things is, well, how do we prevent it from even spilling over to begin with? You know, is it surveillance? Is it mitigations to prevent contact between wildlife and livestock? I mean, can we sort of move that, that bar before it, it actually happens? Um, so I think that's something worth, worth thinking about in, in a gap. Um, so, you know, I, th I think we all know that, th that these systems are complex. And the socio-political aspects of this are certainly uh, a challenge. For those of us that have been involved in the One Health um, type notion, which I'm a huge supporter, um, you know, it, it's got a long ways to go. In the United States, and I, I suspect that this is uh, the case in many countries, you know, state and federal animal health and wildlife authorities, we have different jurisdictions, different missions. Uh, wildlife in the United States are owned by the, the states. Unless they're migratory, then they're managed by the federal government. Um, you know, livestock, it's, it's pretty narrow. We've got regulations and rules, and the state manages them initially unless it is, sort of has a, a larger context, and then the feds come in. Um, so, I mean, I think that there's some challenges there. Um, and in addition, you know, historically, you know, surveillance is also um, widely distributed and, and disjunct. You know, the example um, that I talked about over lunch was avian influenza. Um, you know, USDA did a bunch of surveillance. DOI did a bunch of surveillance. The states did surveillance. That data has never been compiled into one data system and analyzed together. Um, budgets, priorities are uncertain and consistent. You know, all of these things. And, and I'm a big proponent of adaptive management. And this is actually stolen from another presentation that I've got on that. Um, but I think, that, um, I think that this gets back to one of Paul's ideas earlier, is that um, you know, there, this is a, um, a field that is, is highly interdisciplinary, yet many of us come up in different training programs. Um, we belong to different associations, so we don't intermix. We don't drink beer together, typically, right? And so, so that you don't have those sort of that cross-seeding um, you know, of disciplines. Uh, and, I, and I think that does limit, limit this uh, to, to a big degree. All right, on to the science. Um, so some of the broad gaps, and I think I'll try to just summarize some of these um, because uh, my colleagues sort of did a nice job on this. Uh, drivers and processes, biological, anthropogenic. Um, you know, can we identify those on-farm factors that might promote, promote contact or transmission? Are there animal husbandry practices, social... Uh, considerations uh, that need to, need to be taken into uh, account. Are, are there, there sort of, um, you know, processes that we can identify there? Bidirectional nature of transmission. Diagnostic tests. Pauline talked quite a bit about this. We take livestock uh, diagnostics and we, we wedge them in to fit livestock or wildlife. Um, it doesn't always work, and so we need better tools there. And that's a challenge on the modeling side because you have to take into account that uncertainty in the, t in the tests. Uh, effective sur surveillance strategies in both the livestock and the wildlife side. And then the ability to link those data afterwards. Um, oftentimes the, the surveillance is conducted by one agency on, the, on the, the wildlife side. They're using one testing process. On the other side, it's in the livestock. They're doing, using a different testing process. They're keeping different data. Uh, on the livestock side, you're throwing out the negatives. You're only keeping the positives. On the wildlife side, you're keeping both. How do you bring those together and say anything about the system? I think that's a, that's a major challenge and a, ma a big hurdle that we, need, we, we have to overcome. Um, practical mitigation and control methods. Um, can we identify an optical, optimal mix for both the livestock and the wildlife side? Um, where do you devote your resources? Is it on the livestock side? Is it on the wildlife side? Is there some mix of both that can be identified? And then uh, economics uh, and management options. I think that that's a really a, a key piece to all of this is that you can come up with a vaccine for some of these, but 
if it's not economically feasible to distribute it in wildlife, then you're not going to use it. So, you know, I, I think that we need to be thinking about the economics behind some of these things before we start addressing some of the mitigation options. Contact, we talked about this a little bit, but, um, you know, the, the contact structure between livestock and wildlife is largely uncharacterized. There's very few papers in the literature that, that really get at this in a robust way. Um, and, and I'm optimistic about this because we've got, you know, new data and ability to collect data. Um, although th there's problems with that, as many of us will attest, you know, there's t maybe too much data. How do you manage proc proximity logger data? Um, how, how do you apply new methods to, 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 to uh, gain any insights from those data? Um, individual movement among groups, group interaction, frequency duration, both, you know, what, what's important in terms of that? And so that might drive what type of data you actually collect when you implement these studies. Um, indirect environmental contact structure, um, we've talked about that as well. You know, how do we characterize that? How do we design studies to get at that? Um, can we take existing information and, and use it in some model-based framework to, to identify what needs to be collected in the future or, what, uh, or are there some underlying processes that, uh, that we can identify there? Um, I think in this room alone, we've got many pathogen-specific sort of system-specific um, areas. We all work in our own areas. but. Can we identify some higher order processes um, that sort of characterize some of these systems? Are there some, some fundamental things that sort of are unique across systems that, that we can collect information on? Um, Bidirectional trans transmission. Um, this is, everybody's got their soapbox. This is a big one for me. Um, you know, we, we very rarely think about the spillover from livestock to wildlife, and, and I think that that's a very important one when we're thinking about livestock diseases. We always think about wildlife transmitting it back to livestock and being a problem, but if we had prevented it initially, then, then we wouldn't have to deal with it. Um, you know, in, in the United States and, and really worldwide, bovine TB is a great example of this, but, I mean, we've got many examples. Um, We touched on this as well. So what population demographic environmental characteristics are needed? Um, and, and this, I think, is an interesting one for establishment in wildlife. Um, you know, we've got, and I'll sh show a map of TB here in a minute, but um, why haven't we, why hasn't TB become established in more wildlife populations in North America? You know, I mean, what, what's the important mix? Um, you know, why, why does New Zealand have problems with TB and, and Australia doesn't? You know, what's the, what's the, is, the issues there? Um, is it density dependence? Is it, you know, something to do with the, the, the livestock, wildlife, host interactions? I mean, what's the, what are some of the issues there? And can we, can we generalize these? You know, again, can we sort of identify some of those properties um, that, that are important to measure or to include in models? And so this is just sort of an illustrative point uh, by some colleagues. Uh, Matt Farnsworth and Michael Ward. Um, and I think this is a nice example, actually. They looked at uh, AI in, in Romania and identified a certain, certain spread characteristics for waterfowl and a very different spread dynamics for poultry. And I think that this, I think that this is important to think about, that um, you know, how do we identify this? It, what's important and when is it important in terms of the transmission the spread, um, you know, these different parameters. And maybe, we're gonna, maybe we need to measure something different on the livestock side than we do on the wildlife side and vice versa. So are there fundamental components that drive these systems and, and are they different? Mitigations, surveillance, um, when, where, how to do mitigations. Uh, are, are there effective mitigations? Um, you know, can we identify an optimal mix? Uh, can they be targeted in space and time? And I think that that's something that, that we haven't thought much about in this field. Um, Bruce Losa certainly has, but I, I'm not sure it's been uh, much broader than that, at least in North America. Surveillance detection, um, you know, how do we optimize for early or first detection of a pathogen? Um, can we identify very quickly when spillover happens into wildlife? Uh, or if we're thinking about a novel pathogen, um, 
either a pathogen that ha is newly emerging or like H5N1 being introduced into North America, how do we, how do we develop systems that are robust, cost effective, <laughs> can be maintained over the long haul, and offer some early detection or first detection capabilities? When, where, how, and who? What species do you include in the mix? Um, can we identify sentinel species? Um, can we target, uh, target it in an appropriate way to, to reduce our sample size yet still have robust data to make inference from? And this is just, uh, just one example. This is uh, deer, deer visitation of farms in Michigan where you have this increasing visitation in the spring. It drops off. Um, and there seems to be um, a relationship between that and the fasting metabolic rate of, of, of deer. And you know, for those that, that are familiar with cervids, that's because you know, they're pregnant and they're increasing calorie demands as you move into later spring. And so this might offer some opportunity to think about you know, how, do, how do you do things in space and time? Um, you know, maybe, maybe there's some differences. You know, if they're visiting farms here, you have mitigations, but then you don't waste the money and have mitigations at this time of the year. So I think that there's some opportunities for that in addition to surveillance as well. Um, especially when, when we're dealing with, uh, you know, shrinking budgets uh, continually, it seems like. So to get back to my, my point about Embovis, um, so this is where we've identified Embovis in, uh, in cattle in the United States. Um, and so if you contrast that with, with where we've identified it in wildlife, we certainly know that in these cases that livestock and wildlife are involved, have been involved. Um, in these two examples, we know that uh, historically, this is in the 60s, that cattle were involved here and that this was a confined cervid operation that was involved there. Um, but what about these? And why don't we have TB and wildlife all over the place? Um, you know, so I, I, I use this more as a point. Like, you know, that w what's going on with some of these systems where you have effective transmission, and, and not only that, you, have it, you can get it going in, in wildlife, and, and why not other places? And so what does that mean for surveillance? I mean, certainly in the southeast, we've never identified TB, uh, or very rarely, so why waste time doing surveillance here uh, when you can allocate it in, in other, other areas? From more of a regulatory or policy side, um, you know, disease control zones and regions, how do we define that when you have a wildlife livestock involved in the transmission cycle? Um, you know, can you identify effective regions uh, that take into account both the economics but also the biology of the pathogen? Um, how do you do that in a rigorous quantitative way instead of just somebody drawing a line in the sand and saying, you know, on this side um, you, you're not free of the disease, on this side you're free? Um, Surveillance monitoring, I, I keep hitting on this. I, I must think it's important. Um, how do we target optimize? I think that that's a, that's a big one. Um, we don't do a very good job of that on the livestock side. Uh, you know, we, we make some assumptions about you know, um, the, the slaughter plants with the highest volumes. Um, those are the ones that are going to capture the, our populations. Um, we don't think about the geography of how livestock move because we, we don't really have the data to be able to do so. But, um, but I think there, there's opportunities there, and certainly for, for wildlife, they move as well. AI is a, a good example of that. You know, can you optimize your surveillance systems to take that into account? Um, mitigation, economics. I don't know. What, how, how much time do I? Can I go on, ramble on all afternoon? Or? <laughs> all right, I'm going to touch on this because I think this is a really interesting case, um, and I think it points out some of, some of the things that that I've talked about. So some of you might be familiar with the Cattle Fever Tick Program. It's our oldest agricultural disease control program uh, in the United States. TB is actually our second oldest. Um, it's a vector control program. We officially eradicated uh, um, cattle fever ticks, which is the vector for bovine babesiosis, um, back in the 40s. Um, and it was credited as a big success, millions uh, in savings to the cattle industry each year. And there's, uh, there's some work that's indicated that if it was to return to its, its historic range, it would cost $1.2 billion annually to the cattle industry. So it's sort of like, you know, we've, we've done this great thing. So, um, so we eradicated, and we set up this control program where we were dipping cattle um, back in the 40s with the carocides um, that are now banned. Because uh, you, can't, you can't use um, some of these terrible things anymore. 
Um, and so, so we set the policies and set the program in motion, and away it went, right? Um, but we had this, this sort of uh, increasing issue with more, infestated, more infestations uh, in Texas. We're identifying cattle fever ticks more often. What's going on? Oh, it's the acaricides. No, what, what, what is this? And so it, it was hinting at that you know, cattle ticks um, were thought to be host adapted, so one host system. Um, but now we're finding them on deer. Wow, what, what's that about? Um, Yet our program was completely dedicated to focus control efforts exclusively on cattle. Our regulations and our rules and our policies were all in place only to focus on cattle. Um, and once you have a, a rule, it's very difficult to change that rule. Um, so old acaricides were banned. Um, the new acaricides are less effective. Um, and we've got increasing infestations without clear epilinks. And so the, the notion was that we had this one host system, right, where cattle ticks fed on, on, on cattle. And if you just removed um, the cattle from the system, either by, um, by vacating them from the pasture or killing the ticks, then you stop the trans potential for the transmission cycle. And if you, treated the, if you removed the host, then the ticks went away. That was the thought. Um, and it seemed to work. But there's, n there's new evidence, and it's only really recent because there, nobody had money to do work for wildlife related to to um, cattle fever ticks, because it was assumed that they were one host tick, um, where we're finding that ticks do successfully reproduce on white-tailed deer, just at much lower densities. Um, and there's some hints at, um, you know, that maybe the pathogen is also present in, in deer. There's some issues here um, in terms of confirming the pathogen, but there's, there's enough work that's been done there that hints at, well, may, maybe, maybe the pathogen is present in deer. Um, so that means that suddenly you've moved from a one-host system to a multi-host system, but your control program is completely set up to manage for a single-host system. Um, and so I think that the, there's, there's some interesting things that happened here, and this illustrates that systems change, and how do we account for these in, in, in our models. We eradicated back in 1943, after the market hunting era and everything else, where we killed most of the wildlife in North America. So the deer populations in Texas were at their lowest at that point. Um, and then you can see as the deer have been, become very successful in Texas, you know, we've, we do a lot of supplemental feeding. You know, it's a big industry. And so now we've got this huge change in the host density out there, alternative hosts. Um, and you can see this increase in the number of infestations as well. We didn't take this into account, though, because it was a one-host system. In addition, um, we added um, uh, uh, 70, 70 uh, exotic ungulate species to the landscape in Texas. Um, so, so just, uh, you know, the, the, the numbers are a little crude here, but, um, you know, that's about 200,000 animals out there the last time we did any census work, and that was back in 1943. Um, so there's probably many more now. We're adding about one species a year uh, during, from 1963 through the, the mid-90s. So not only did you have an increase in, in deer numbers, but then you had a huge number of additional hosts added to the system, um, many of them from the native range for cattle fever ticks, cattle ticks you know, in Africa, Neil Guy being one of them. <laughs> um, so the, host, the, the system changed dramatically, yet our notion was that this is the way the system works. It's a one-host system. It's cattle ticks. It's, it's, um, it's cattle. We don't need to think about wildlife. I think that there's a lot of examples of this in the literature. TB is a great, another great one. You know, deer could never become endemic. And so, so I, th I think that our notions of how these systems work we need to sort of revisit those because um, we don't know enough about these systems. And we can get ourselves in trouble because we set these regulatory policies in place, and then suddenly we've got potentially the, the, the vector reestablished, um, and we didn't even know it because we were sort of weren't paying attention to the, what the system was telling us. Um, so I think you know, that's, you know, we can expect that these systems will change, and how do we incorporate that in sort of our modeling frameworks? You know, is there a way to sort of think about and include that uncertainty about the, the systems? So just to quick, quickly highlight, um, 
so on the wildlife side, um, you know, detection and surveillance, we don't have good, robust systems control. Um, do we control it if we have spillover or if we identify it? Do we care if we identify a pathogen in wildlife? Um, do we even have the tools to be able to control, to control it once it's there? Contact structure, which, which species are involved in the cycle? Um, how do we define those contacts between species within uh, species? Um, we think about the connections, uh, you know, contact structure again, transmission rate, seasonality, the biogeography, um, you know, why, why can a pathogen get established in one part of the country and not in others? You know, what are some of those other environmental drivers? Mitigations, do we have any? Um, can we implement some? Um, on the livestock side, mitigations, can we prevent the spillover to begin with? Uh, you know, can we develop better robust uh, detection and surveillance systems? Uh, control, we've got better tools because we can just kill them all, but a lot of times that's not economically feasible anymore. So, um, and so we've got lots of challenges ahead of us, feral swine being one of those. So, take any questions? <laughs>